the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So not everyone um, chose to be here this morning. We're competing with the World Cup final and with breakfast at Wimbledon. So uh, you know, thank you all very, very much. Uh, I did get to watch a little bit of breakfast at Wimbledon yesterday, and uh, the focus was sort of on the matches at hand, uh, but also on the princesses' first, uh, uh, first outing together and uh, what they were wearing and uh, the royal box and how wonderful it looked to be able to be uh, there watching about 11 hours worth of tennis, it seemed, uh, in the royal box and, and how great it must be to be a princess. Uh, we have two stories today that uh, belie that truth. Um, that it's easy to be part of the royal family or that everything goes smoothly within the royal household. Um, this is a little bit more of a Bible study or flushing out the story than a streamlined sermon, so follow me very, very closely. But they're two fun, fascinating stories. Uh, first, the story that we heard about David. And we can't tell the story about David without the other uh, prime character in this story uh, and that is Michal, his wife, one of his many wives. Uh, she is almost a tragic character in Scripture. Um, she is Saul's youngest daughter. And the story begins with um, uh, David having been anointed as the one to come, uh, uh, which usually doesn't put you in good stead with the one who is, King Saul, uh, uh, promises to anyone who defeats Goliath uh, and, and rids them of the, the, the Philistine problem that they're having, uh, the oldest daughter's hand in marriage. And so David, uh, the young boy, uh, uh, kills uh, Goliath with a stone, with a slingshot, um, and uh, Saul conveniently forgets about that promise, doesn't give uh, the eldest, which, uh, uh, which in turn gets a huge sigh of relief uh, from Michal, uh, who is the only woman in Scripture for whom it says she loved him. She loved David uh, so longingly, so fully, uh, that it consumed her. Uh, it says twice in Scripture uh, how much she loved David. Um, but David wasn't uh, able to just take her hand in marriage. It doesn't say that David actually had a whole lot of affection for her, uh, but the story continues and David is now becoming a little bit of a folk hero, and Saul is becoming more and more uh, annoyed by this uh, little upstart. Um, and the upstart also not only has his youngest daughter's affection, uh, but also his son Jonathan's friendship uh, and, uh, and growing popularity in the community. And so Saul comes up with the idea uh, of a better way to keep him under his thumb is to give him the youngest daughter's hand in marriage. So they start negotiating dowry. Um, and uh, your fragile ears, you can cover them now. Uh, uh, but Saul says, in exchange for 300 Philistine, Philistine uh, foreskins, uh, you can have my youngest daughter in marriage. Um, diplomacy only gets you so far when that's uh, what you need to deliver. Uh, so I, th I think Saul figured this will solve my problem one of two ways. Uh, most likely, David will... Uh, uh, be killed when he goes to uh, fulfill his, his dowry requirement. Uh, and if he survives that, uh, I'll at least have him under my nose a little bit uh, more tightly. And somehow he comes back uh, uh, with what he uh, uh, is, is promised to Saul. Uh, Saul has no choice, but uh, gives his youngest daughter in marriage. Um, and there is no, uh, there's no mention of David having uh, much in the way of amorous feelings towards her, uh, but she is in love uh, and loyal to a fault to David, so much so that when things come to a, a boiling over point, uh, and Saul is so mad that he throws a spear uh, at David, and David escapes uh, and runs home, she hides him and then helps him escape through the window and then takes uh, these clay vessels, uh, puts them in his bed to make it look like he's there, convinces Saul's soldiers uh, that he is near death uh, from injuries sustained and, uh, and uh, that she has him uh, there and that they need to go back. Uh, they go back to Saul. Saul doesn't believe any of the story. When they come back the next day, uh, they realize it is vessels. David is long gone. Um, and David makes absolutely no attempt to come back for her. 
Um, in fact, while he's away in exile, he takes on several more wives. Um, and uh, and never, never so much as a note. Um, so much so, uh, this is a pretty tortured woman. I mean, this is uh, so much so uh, that Saul gives her away to someone else. Uh, and the beautiful part of that story is that she seems to have found somebody that loves her. Um, uh, she's happily uh, married at this point. Uh, but things start to crumble under Saul. Saul is killed as, as well as three of his sons, uh, and David sees an opportunity and comes in uh, and, and takes that kingship that's been long uh, promised to him. He becomes king, and he sees um, uh, a rivalry with the one remaining son. Uh, uh, but he gets the upper hand, and so that one remaining son of Saul, uh, Mika's, uh, Michal's uh, brother, uh, negotiates a peace settlement uh, with, uh, with David. Uh, and part of the peace settlement, uh, not because of uh, amorous affection, uh, but more because of pride, uh, and then having something that belonged to Saul, uh, he says, well, give me back my wife, uh, to which the current husband is absolutely bereft, so much so that he, uh, he goes to uh, attack until uh, the other brother, the king uh, of that territory, says, uh, no, uh, I'll kill you. Uh, you need to let her go. She is bereft. Uh, she's finally found somebody who met her, uh, her open heart, um, uh, and she's returned to David, uh, where David uh, considers her among her, his lot of wives. Um, and, um, and then as soon as the negotiation is made, uh, David kills the other remaining brother and, uh, and unifies the two territories. Uh, and then decides uh, that this would be an appropriate time to take the Ark of the Covenant uh, to Jerusalem, to really center that uh, as the center of the new kingdom. Um, and remember, the Ark of the Covenant contains the, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, a, a golden bowl, uh, where uh, the manna that fell from the heavens that sustained them during their time in the wilderness, uh, and Aaron's staff uh, that bloomed almonds and other things at the top of his staff. So those things are kept in the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and it's transported. Uh, but during the transporting, and this is the part that's cut out of the story, um, one person uh, loses their balance and accidentally touches it uh, and is killed immediately. Uh, and David gets a, l a little antsy about that uh, and asks him just to leave it alone. Uh, so it stays in the small town for three months, and that small town is blessed uh, with wonderful luck and, 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 um, and, and fortuitous events uh, so that David says, well, no, no, let's get it all the way to Jerusalem. Uh, and they're praying it into Jerusalem, uh, and that's when David is in a uh, uh, scantily clad loincloth uh, dancing uh, with uh, almost in total ecstasy, um, uh, an affection he shows for God that he never showed uh, for his uh, for his wife, um, and uh, and she watches as uh, as the the handmaidens all watch on as David uh, contorts and and uh, uh, and carries on and. Uh, both for the, the uh, wide eyes of the handmaidens all gathered around, uh, also because uh, he is celebrating as, as, as Saul, his, her father's empire is, is ground into dust, uh, uh, the last vestige uh, uh, being wiped away, um, uh, and also because she's longed for so much of her life uh, for even a glimpse of that kind of affection from David uh, that is uh, uh, bestowed so graciously and fully upon God. Um, and then uh, she uh, finally calls him out uh, and says, you know, how can you be carrying on like this? Um, to which, uh, whether divine punishment or just consequence, she has uh, no heirs, uh, and therefore Saul's kingdom uh, dies with her. Um, and it's a heartbreaking story. Uh, but I think of that, and I think of one of the pitfalls of, um, uh, or one of the warnings of discipleship that it's wonderful to have that kind of love and passion for God. Uh, but if the litmus test for what kind of a disciple uh, D David was, uh, was how he treated the person closest to him, he would fail miserably. He would fail miserably. Um, that blessing at the end of the service, remember that life is short and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. Um, by that litmus test, he would fail miserably. Um, Yet is exalted as one of the great uh, one of the greats in our uh, in, in in our faith story. Um, a lesson about discipleship and about how we reveal discipleship and about uh, the call not only to love God with all your heart uh, but to love your neighbor and especially your life companion uh, as yourself. 
And then the second, the gospel today. And uh, Mark doesn't put any extra detail anywhere. So the fact that he goes on to an aside uh, that is almost our entire gospel for today uh, must be more than just an accidental explanation uh, where he goes on to talk about Herod's story. Uh, so this chapter of Mark starts with Jesus being, being rejected in Nazareth. He is rejected in his own hometown, uh, and then he uh, sends his disciples out. Um, and he tells them, just, you know, go out two by two, just take what always is on your back. And then he tells the story of the cost of discipleship. Or he doesn't tell the story, Mark tells the story. Uh, as they're trying to figure out who Jesus is, um, uh, word is spread, um, and uh, Herod is convinced, uh, as are others, that this is John reincarnated. And then we hear what happened to John. Now, John had every opportunity to just turn a blind eye to Herod. Uh, everybody knew that Herod wasn't uh, the most rigid Jew. Uh, he was pretty much Jew only in heritage. Uh, he wasn't practicing all that faithfully. He wasn't part of uh, John's inner circle. Uh, John could have done uh, uh, just fine by just saying, Herod's Herod. Uh, you're my community. I'm going to teach you uh, what the law says. But he doesn't because he is unflinching, because his understanding of discipleship uh, is absolute. Uh, and so he calls out Herod, and he calls out Herod's wife, Herodias, and says, you can't do that. She was married to your brother. Your brother's still alive. You can't just take uh, her as, as, as your wife. Uh, no. And it is so embarrassing to Herodias that she demands that he be arrested. Um, uh, and Herod, uh, as lapsed as he might be in, uh, in his faith, uh, there is something about uh, John that either scares him to death or captivates him. There's something uh, true and undeniable about what comes out of John's mouth that he can't ignore. Um, and I think he knows, his conscience tells him, this is of God, and anything that I do uh, against this is a violation of that. Um, but power, uh, power can be dangerous. And so he's celebrating his birthday, and he's carrying on with all of his friends, and his daughter uh, performs this absolutely beautiful dance, and as a show of might, uh, uh, you know, kind of probably elbowing his friends, he says, that was so wonderful, I'll give you whatever you want, even half my kingdom, uh, hoping she didn't ask for half the kingdom. Uh, and so she goes, and she conspires with her mom, also Herodias, um, what should we do? Um, and uh, she says, ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter. Um, and so it's served. Uh, so this sermon has had both 300 foreskins and a beheaded man. So I apologize for that. Hardly the gospel you thought you were going to show up to hear. Um, but there's a warning to the disciples who are sent out into the world that discipleship has a cost. It's also a foreshadowing of the cost that discipleship had for Jesus and for those around him. Uh, that if you want to be a child of God, if you want to follow Jesus, you need to be unrelenting and you need to realize uh, it may not end uh, uh, where you think it's going to end, uh, but that won't be the end. So then we have the very next story. Because with Mark, you've got to figure out why he put that detail in. And the very next story is a different kind of banquet. A very different kind of banquet from the one that ended in death. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And so those two are juxtaposed to one another. And we're reminded that discipleship might not be easy, and it might have cost. But in the end, in the ultimate end, God's banquet and God's kingdom, all are fed, and none go home hungry, and that there's enough for all. And so we see the abundance and the joy and the fullness of God's vision, separate from the, the vision of this world from the things that corrupt. And so a uh, complicated way to get around how these two stories, these two stories uh, around earthly thrones uh, point in a totally different direction to what it's like to be gathered around God's throne um, where everybody is fed and we all eat together and we all break bread together around God's holy table. Amen.